Hi, everyone. Um, so nice to be here with you. And thank you, Yufei, for having me. So um, my name is again, Terry Bennett, and I'm the money coach at Max Money Center. And before I just start uh, my presentation to you, I just want to go over what Max Money Center is. So um, the goal of the center is to support students in anything, any kind of questions, concerns, advocacy, um, anything that um, involves your financial life. So what we do is we run webinars or workshops um, all through the semester on all sorts of various topics of financial literacy. Um, we um, have a website, money.mcmaster.ca. Um, it's got all sorts of useful information and I'll be sort of referring to that as we go along. It's, it's really worth going on and seeing um, different areas that you might be interested in that we might not even get a chance to touch on today. Uh, we also do live events. We bring in guest speakers. We do fun things um, in the hallways and, and in, um, you know, in organizations uh, to bring financial literacy um, to the students because it's such a huge topic and nobody, I know I think sometimes international students think that they're the only ones who don't know about Canadian financial systems, but honestly, neither do the Canadians. Um, so uh, we're always trying to give out information. Um, and the last thing is that you can also, if you have very specific concerns that you don't want to talk about in a, web, in a webinar or a workshop that you would like individual attention, um, you'd like to the you know, sort of go into a topic that concerns you, um, you can actually see me or there's another money coach as well. Um, and we will meet with you individually. Um, I don't know if you guys know about Oscar Plus, it's the booking system uh, for um, all sorts of things um, uh, that are going on in the university. You can go on Oscar Plus and book an appointment. You can also just write to money.mcmaster.ca and ask for an appointment to review your finances um, and, and we'll hook up with you, okay? So that's what Max Money Center is about. We really hope that you'll use us. And actually, because this uh, webinar or this, yeah, um, is, is so full of information, we might not even get through everything today. Um, I'm happy to answer questions, um, you know, while you're still in your home country, you can, again, money.mcmaster.ca, you can ask for Terry Bennett, uh, that she please um, um, give you an appointment and, uh, or just, um, that would be a great way for us, we could zoom it or we could just um, write each other um, emails. So um, anyway, let's get started. Um, I already talked about what Max Money Center is. Um, we're on, um, actually the best way to find out what's going on at Max Money Center um, is this, but also going through the Student Success Center. Um, their website is much bigger and, and has more events that are going on. So Student Success Center. Um, and I don't know, maybe you say you, I don't have that um, uh, link handy. Okay, so I'm going to take a look at what are some of the costs in Hamilton. I'm going to talk to you about banking and I'm going to spend a fair amount of time on banking because my thought is that's probably the most important thing you need to do um, as you, you know, come into Canada for the first time. You need to have a way to manage your money, um, get your money from your home country. Um, so I'm going to talk about how banking works in this country and how you can open an account. I will mention the fact that um, you that we use credit cards here and um, just a little bit about credit cards, a little bit about um, savings and budgeting ideas, um, employment, if you're planning on working here, some ideas about employment and the fact that there are taxes in this country when you get paid, you have to pay a certain amount of your income back to the government and uh, give you some more resources as we go along the way. So that's what my plan is. Please feel free to ask questions. I'm not married to doing this exactly. If you have questions that are, you know, that you're finding more important, put them in the Q&A. And, uh, you know, if we go off topic, that's fine with me. Okay, so here's the average. So what are some of the costs? I'm gonna talk about housing initially. Um, I know that you had a whole housing workshop so um, I'm not going to go into a lot of detail. I'm just going to put up here the prices that are typical right now in Hamilton for different um, ways that you can live. So rooms um, in a house that has all sorts of other rooms and they're all filled with students, but, you know, absolute apartments. 
um, living in somebody's home, um, and, and there are some private student residences as well. So um, these are all the prices right now. Do you have to tell you that inflation um, is running very high in Canada in general, as it is in everywhere else in the world. Um, these prices are much higher than they were even a year or two ago. Um, our hope is that when inflation gets under control, as the government is trying very hard to, um, to lower our inflation rate, that some of these prices uh, will go back to something that was more typical, uh, really basically prior to the pandemic. But this is what you're sort of facing now in rent. Okay, one thing that I do want to let you know is um, that because um, just the way our government works, if you rent, you are actually able to get some money back from the government in terms of helping you pay for your rent. It's not a lot of money. It may only be an extra 50 or $60 a month, but every little bit helps. Um, and the reason how you get this rent rebate through your taxes is you will have to file taxes. Um, Max Money Center will help you file taxes for free. We do thousands every year. Um, and our biggest group that we do help is actually international students. Um, if you are going to um, be in a rental situation, this is what we will need um, when you file your taxes. Just want you to be aware of it now. You will need to have the address that you are renting. You'll need to know your landlord or the company that you're renting from's name. Um, you'll need to know the dates that you started renting. Okay, so if it was January to, you know, next December to the following December, it's you're on a 12 month lease that we just need to have the date the dates when you're renting and the actual amount each month you're paying. Now, landlords by law are supposed to give you a receipt, which means a receipt is proof that you paid. It's usually a little piece of paper um, and they sign it and date it. Some landlords don't want to let the government know that they're getting income from rental properties. They wanna hide that money. So some of them will demand that you pay in cash. If they're demanding it and it's the only house you can find, you may just have to go into a situation where you're paying in cash. We would recommend though that you don't because cash cannot, you'll never, there's no um, way to prove that you paid that money. Therefore you wouldn't be eligible for this rental tax rebate, um, but you can pay with a check, um, a banking check. You can pay with automatic payments through your bank. So, um, or you can get them just to agree that they're going to give you at the end of the year or every month, something that just says, yes, you paid with their name on it and all this information that I just told you. So be wary of places that want you to pay rent uh, in cash if you can, okay? Um, another thing about, just one more thing about housing. A lot of the places that you'll go into will not include in your rent um, electricity. And that can be um, expensive. So just a little piece of information for you. When you there's all these different rates, you'll see over here, you've got off peak, mid peak and on peak. So if you are running, you know, um, you're going to be doing laundry, uh, you're going to be on the computer for a really long period of time, you're going to be maybe doing a lot of cooking, um, anything that's going to take electricity, Weekends and holidays, the entire weekend the ent and any whole holiday, you know, is always the lowest rate. So try to do the bulk of your long, heavy duty electricity use on the weekends and holidays. And also you'll see wherever it's green, anywhere, you can just look in the summertime, the, the, the configuration is a little bit different uh, because when it's dark and light, but you can notice that, you know, in the evening, um, it's cheaper from seven o'clock on to the morning. And it's during the day where the two highest peaks are. So I spend a lot of time making sure that I don't turn things on if I don't need to until after seven o'clock at night. And then I do a lot of my laundry and stuff on the weekends. And it just keeps your bill a little bit lower. And every time you can make a cost cheaper, that's the way to go. Okay, now the next biggest expense, um, not including your rent, of course, is food. And to be just really blunt, the best way to make things cheaper is not to eat 
on campus and not to eat in restaurants. It is the most expensive way of eating. And I know it's also the most convenient. So it's difficult sometimes for students to always make their lunches and their suppers. But if you can, that's what we recommend. Bring your lunch to work. I'm sorry, bring your lunch to school. Um, so I always think that it's easy if you're making supper or you're gonna do a bunch of cooking, let's say on the weekend, um, cook enough that you've got leftovers so that leftovers is your lunch and your main meal is, is you can have it for supper. If you are going to um, do that, the best way is to go to grocery stores and buy your food from grocery stores. So you'll see throughout Hamilton, there are, grocery stores that specialize in certain areas um, of the world. They have uh, rest, um, what do you call it? Gro grocery stores that specialize in Indian food, Thai, uh, you know, whatever. You can sometimes find your own um, home country's food, but really the cheapest place to buy the food and in order to prepare it is there are two um, two uh, grocery stores near McMaster University. One is called Food Basics. Um, the other one is called um, Fortino's. Both of those stores have 10% off food on Tuesdays. So if you can shop on a Tuesday and these stores are generally open from early in the morning till eight, nine, 10 o'clock at night, um, that's really a good way to get 10% off. Um, Fortino's is a little bit more expensive than Food Basics. Food Basics is probably, um, it's sort of like a, not a very fancy store. You pay a little bit less. And sometimes for the exact same product, it's cheaper at Food Basics. So these are just some little hints about doing stuff. Um, there are all these stores everywhere in the whole city. They have flyers that come out every week, usually a Wednesday, around Wednesday or Thursday. And they will go through all their sales that they have. So again, what I typically do is I take a look at the flyers. They usually come to your house um, or apartment building, whatever you're living in. And they will say what the specials are for that week. And I typically try to eat what's on sale. So if they're having, you know, chickens on sale or fish is on sale or certain vegetables, that's I'm making my list of what I'm eating for the week based on their sales. There's always sales. It's There's always, um, it's, if you don't see what you like this week, it'll probably be on sale next week. So buy on sale, buy, use your flip, your, your, um, your uh, flyers. Also, there's two really good apps that I suggest using. One is called flip.com. Um, flip is, um, it's got all sorts of the stores in the whole area of Hamilton and even surrounding areas. You put in what you want. So let's say you're going to buy a big ticket item like some of the things that are expensive are laundry detergents and things like that. Or, or um, uh, And so I go on if I'm looking for something that I really don't want to spend like a lot of and trying to find it on sale. I'm going to go on to flip. I'm going to write in who's got the best price for, you know, yogurt and up will come all the places that have yogurt on sale. And hopefully you can find one near your house um, that you can do your shopping there. Um, there's also something called checkout51.com. It's interesting. It, it actually gives you cash back. So it, um, you buy products that um, you go on their website, you see what products they're sort of pushing. If those products are things that you can use, you can buy the product and then you just keep your receipt and then they give you um, a cash back for having buying it. And it's sort of like a way to promote product and you, you, get, the, you get the savings um, back by, in cash. So those are two really good help um, around food. Um, so um, that um, just in general terms, I want to give you the name of another app, um, website, a link that might be useful to you. It's called numbio.com. Numbio is a really good site to get a sense of what living is going to cost you in Hamilton. Um, it's going to look at entertainment. It's going to look at all sorts of food. It'll tell you, um, you know, what the price of bread, milk, eggs, it'll break it all down. It'll talk about um, eating out in restaurants, the, the more cheaper restaurants, the more expensive restaurants, um, it can tell you all sorts of things. So if you're looking to see how much you're going to spend on things in a month, you can go on to Numbio now and sort of take a look. 
Also, what Numbio does, which I think is really helpful, if you were in a position where you can't find housing that you like in Hamilton and you're thinking, maybe I'll go to one of the neighboring little um, towns um, that are all around Hamilton, um, you can put in the name of that town um, and you can compare it to the prices in Hamilton. And you can see, you know, are, are things really that much cheaper in these little towns than living in Hamilton? So. Um, it's just a really good comparison tool and a good way for you to figure out in real detail what it's going to cost you um, to live here. Okay, the other thing I just want to briefly, another thing that's big and uh, possibly on your budget is going to be transportation. So when you pay your tuition to McMaster, you are automatically going to have free bus service in the city, in, the, in Hamilton. It's called the Hamilton Street Railway. And it's just part of your tuition. So, you know, if you're on a bus line, if you can try to find a place near a bus line, you're going to be able to come to and from school uh, for free. Um, if you're planning on going throughout, like beyond Hamilton, but to these neighboring towns or even further afield, there's something called a Presto card. Um, that's a really handy thing. It's not necessarily cheaper, but it's handy. Um, because um, you put your money, you can go to stores, you can get it at the university, it's, you know, on, 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 on our campus, you can buy these cards, you can put whatever money you want on it, and then you just carry the card. And then when you're going on any of these other um, services that um, you just, you know, sort of swipe your card and, and uh, the money comes off it until you run out, and then you can reload your card. So Presto cards are just easy to have. Um, also, if you're planning on maybe traveling around, um, not just not in Hamilton, but outside of Hamilton, maybe you have friends that are living in Toronto, Mississauga, maybe you'd like to go further afield um, to Ottawa, maybe, you know, outside, even anywhere in North America, there is a bus service called Flexbus. Um, if you look at their um, website, it's called shop.flexbus.com. Um, it's got discounted fares for all over basically North America. So rather than just going to a typical bus service that's well known, look on their website, they have discounted prices. So help you with that. If you are going to consider living outside of Hamilton or on the outskirts of Hamilton, and you're going to um, need transportation that isn't covered by the Hamilton Street Railway, you do have to think about, yes, maybe the rent is cheaper, but maybe the cost of transportation is going to offset it. So do make sure that when you're trying to figure out where you wanna live and it's not more accessible, that you put into the price what it's gonna cost you, gas, car maintenance, um, you know, bus fares, whatever, and also the time that it's going to take you. You need to put in the time um, as, a, as a variable to not just money, but it's time away from studying and whatnot. Um, just two other little things to tell you in terms of some links. Um, there is a, um, uh, an app called ridesharing.com and it connects drivers to passengers. So let's say you are living on the outskirts of Hamilton or in some of these little towns around us, you may be able to go on to the ride share. And if there's someone coming from your area and you need to, to hop on in their car and help share the cost of gas and whatnot, they'll connect you, ridesharing.com. And for those of you who would like to, take, to be able to ride a bicycle around town or you need to get some place that it's a little bit off a bus line and it would be a long walk. All through the city of Hamilton, there are bikes. It's called Sobe. Um, they're little blue bikes and they're all over the place. And you can pick up a bike and you can use it and then you can drop it off at another site where the bikes are all kept. And um, you just pay um, for the use of the bike for whatever time or mileage you're using. It's really handy. I see lots of students using um, rent a bike, so be. Okay. Okay, let's go on. So that's just in a nutshell some information about housing costs or just costs in general of living in Hamilton and some cheaper ways to do them. So I want to talk now a little bit about banking and I'm going to call them FIs. What is an FI? It stands for financial institution and it's 
And in Canada, there are a number of different types of financial institutions. And we tend to call everything a bank, but there are actually differences between the big Canadian banks <clears throat> and what we also use in this country are called credit unions. Very, very quickly, a bank is, the banking system in this country is legislated, is, is actually watched by the federal government. All of these banks have to adhere to federal guidelines on how to bank. And, um, and most of these banks are owned by shareholders. So they're big, massive companies that trade on stock exchange. And because they're trading and they're asking people to invest in their, in their organization, in their financial institution, the bottom line for these banks is to make sure that they make a big profit so that people who've invested their money are getting a good return from their investment, okay? So banks are driven by profit. And that's okay, nothing wrong with that, but you have to know that because profit is the bottom line, they are more rigid about their rules about who they lend money to, um, what the interest rates are. They're just really overwhelmingly um, influenced by profit. On the other hand, the credit unions, they are, um, they are sort of managed by provincial governments. Um, and they actually are not, you don't invest in them. If you put your money in a credit union, you become an owner of the credit union. You actually become a member of the team. You could actually go on their board of directors and help manage them if you wanted to. And if the, the credit union that you belong to makes money, um, you'll actually get some, um, you'll get some reward for having, you know, being a member of, of this financial institution. And credit unions, because they see you as a member, they really have, their rules are more flexible, they're more willing to work with you if you're having problems than a big bank is, and their interest rates are generally more competitive. They're more competitive in that you save money with them, you get more interest, and if you're borrowing from them, often their interest is, is lower than the big banks. So. When you come to Canada, everybody just thinks of the big, big federal banks, things like Bank of Montreal, Nova, Bank of Nova Scotia, CIBC, Royal Bank. Those are the big Canadian banks. But really, the credit unions are equally, um, if not better, I think sometimes because of their flexibility. Um, so think about um, a, a typical a credit union um, in Hamilton is called Meridian. Um, um, anyway, you can see them on our website. We try to list some um, that are available to you. And then, of course, they're all the virtual banks, which means they don't have a branch. They don't have an office. They don't have, you know, a, a standing, you know, structure. It's all online banks. And they're safe. Um, and a lot of them are actually owned by these big, big banks. And they have their banking, in, you know, their branch banks and then they have the virtual ones and the virtual banks are generally like the more like the credit unions in that because there's no offices and, and staffing that they're doing um, you know having to to um, pay uh, the virtual banks often will have better interest rates again um, better rates to borrow and better rates to save so the virtual banks are all um, you know worth looking into um, so I'll kind of come back and show you where you can find all these things in a minute. I just want to go on to talking about, so here you are, you come to Canada and you're going to figure out which bank or credit union you want to use. And you're going to have to open an account. And there's three different kinds of accounts major within each category. There are hundreds of different kinds, really literally, but this is, you have checking accounts, you have savings accounts and you have something called high interest savings accounts. And I'm gonna go into a little bit more detail, but first I just have to tell you what a word means, a transaction. So when you're um, picking your account, one of the things you're, you need to think about is how many transactions am I going to do in a month? Because you're gonna get billed by how many transactions you do. Um, or uh, so, let me just explain to you what a transaction is. Anytime you move your money from one place to another, then it is called a transaction. 
So if you put money into the into the bank, you make a deposit, that's a transaction. If you go in and take money out, a withdrawal, that is a transaction. If you're going to transfer money from one account to another account or from one savings account to a checking account, those are all transactions. We have something called automated, automated teller machines. They're called ATMs. All the banks have these bank machines and you can do um, you can transfer money using these automatic transfer machines they're usually they're often all over the place you can find them in numerous places and also your bank itself where you the, the branch that you open your account in um, will have an ATM as you know like actually on site as well anytime you use that automatic automated teller machine it's a transaction so if you're someone who's going to be doing a lot of depositing withdrawing money transferring money um, using the atm you're going to be maybe um, um, you know just doing anything that you might have to do uh, pay a bill you can pay you can do through your banks that's going to be a transaction so you need to think am i doing 10 a month or am i doing 30 or 40 a month um, one of the things that you'll see is that most bank, most students will get a free bank account. They want your business. All these financial institutions want your business because generally once you start off with one financial institution, most people tend to stay with them for a long period of time. So the way to grab students when they're young or new to the country, then they make their, uh, if you're a student, they give you a free account. The problem with the free accounts is that some of them will have limited transactions. So if they're giving you with your free account, maybe 10 or 15 transactions a month, and you know you're gonna be doing way more than that, it may not be in your best interest to take the free account. It might be better for you to spend $9, $12 a month. Um, it varies depending on what financial institution you're using, but it might be better for you just to pay the monthly fee and have unlimited transactions. So take, you know, try to figure out in the first little while that you're here, you know, how many, how much am I actually using um, the banking system that I'm in and how many transactions am I doing? Okay. Lots of ways to bank in this country. You can do it in person. You can do it over the phone. You can do it on the internet. You can put it on your phone. Um, and you can do it at the at these mobile at these automated teller machines ATMs, and you'll all of you when you open your account will get something called a debit card. The debit card is not a credit card; they're two completely different things. The debit card is a card that says instead of you using cash and having to have cash on you, you can pay with your debit card anywhere. And the debit card, when you use it automatically takes the money that you just spent out of your account. So if you buy something at the grocery store and you spend $40 on food, you use your debit card, your, your, your bank account will automatically be debited, will be out of it, will be withdrawn the $40, okay? So debit cards come with your account and it's not unusual at all for students and new immigrants whatever, to also be offered when you open an account, a credit card. Credit cards are different. A credit card is basically, they're loaning you money. And most credit cards come with a, with a limit on it. Okay, so they're going to decide, oh, you're a brand new student here. I think what we'll do is allow you to have access to $1,000. Sometimes it's even as high as $1,500. That limit tells you that's how much you get to use on your card that you get to buy something and put it on your card, on your credit card. This credit card has to be paid every month. And if you don't pay it every month, you will then start to have interest on what you haven't paid for for that month. And the interest charged on these cards are very high. It can be as high as 20%. That's a lot of money. And if you continually use your card and you don't pay it off each month, it's not hard before you know it to maybe be close to your $1,000 limit or your $1,500 limit. And at 20%, it's very hard to dig out of that debt. So we're not telling you, and we're not recommending that you don't get a card. We actually think it's helpful to get a credit card. What we want you to do is learn to use your credit card really well. And we have 
all sorts of webinars and workshops all the time through Max Money Center where we're talking to you and explaining to you how credit cards work, how to avoid interest charges, how to use them properly. Because used properly, they'll be very helpful to you. Because every time you use and you have to pay, you borrow money and you pay it back, you start to build what we call in Canada a credit score. It's called your credit report. And the stronger your credit report and your higher your credit score is, the more you'll be able to access money, especially when you graduate and you have a job and you may need to get a car. You may need to want to do things like, you know, set up a new apartment and buy beds and furniture and you might not be able to do it. You may need to borrow some money alone. And if you have a solid credit report with a good good credit score, you'll be able to not only get access to loans when you need them, but you'll also be able to negotiate better interest, you know, better rates on things, a better interest rate. So it's, it's really is good to build a credit report while you're a student in the anticipation of if you stay in Canada and you're going to live here for a while or forever, whatever, um, that you have used the time as a student to use your credit card really well and slowly build up a good report and score. So just be mindful that credit cards are good, but credit cards can be difficult to manage if you don't use it properly. Terry, okay. before we move away from the slide, we do have a question from a student in the Q&A. So the question is about transactions. Uh, sure. so is buying stuff using credit or debit cards considered a transaction? Yeah. Um, so they mean whenever you buy something at the store using a POS system. And so is it going to be count as a transaction in your account? No, no. I think if it did that, we'd all be in big trouble. Yeah. No, um, but no, they don't count that. It's really using, um, it's a transaction where you're using something at the bank. So depositing, withdrawing, transferring, bill payments, it's that kind of thing. It's, it's a movement within the banking system, not what you're doing with your debit card or credit card. No, no. Or paying in cash even. No. It's, okay. is that, is that clear you, Faye? Yes. Thank you, Terry. Okay. You're welcome. Anything else that you want me to stop and talk about? Nope, that's our only question so far. Okay, great. Oh, that was easy. Okay, so you're um, you're an international student coming here. You're going to have to um, have a little bit um, more uh, identification um, to open an account. Um, so you'll need two different types of um, two two different pieces of identification. You have to have one either a permanent resident card, a confirmation of PR permanent resident status, or a temporary permit, which probably most of you are on. Um, so you need one of those pieces of, an, of identification. And then you also need one from this list, a passport or some sort of Canadian ID card. Um, you may need your study permit or some other government form that says that you're here to study or work and study. Um, a driver's license, um, if you're American, um, if you're coming here from the United States, I believe that the American license is as good as a Canadian license, driver's license. And um, if you haven't used your temporary permit in the first one, um, then you can use it again here. It looks like you'll have to use it in the first one though. Um, so anyway, that just for you to know, go um, with, with two pieces of identification. And if you are going to do this, the free student card, you will need your Mac ID. And if you don't have Mac ID yet, um, you can use your, um, your uh, piece of paper that says that you've been accepted into McMaster as a student. Um, but somehow you've got to show that you're a Mac student, okay, or will be a Mac student to get the student, free student card. Okay. This seems to confuse a lot of people, so I'm going to go over it. There are two, remember I said to you there's three types of accounts, checking and savings and a high interest savings account. So this is how we recommend that you use these accounts. Your checking account is for your day-to-day -day monthly expenses, heat, hydro, um, that's electricity, rent, uh, food, um, you know, entertainment for the month, all of that day-to-day -day stuff. So this, these accounts should only hold the money that you sort of need for that month. 
Okay, so let's say you come here from another country and you coming with maybe I'm just going to make this up $5,000. But you know that you're that each month, maybe you really only need 2000 to pay for everything. So what I would recommend that you do is, is that you open up a savings account. And there are lots of different kinds of savings accounts. But within the savings account, there's something called a high interest savings account. That's going to give you the most interest on whatever money you've got in your savings account. And most of these high interest savings accounts will give you, they will compound interest, they will add interest on a daily basis and put it into your account each at the end of every month. And the interest rates will be higher. Checking accounts have no interest associated with them. You're just simply giving you an opportunity to place your money someplace, okay? And hold it and be able to use debit cards and whatnot, you know, for it. So you want to keep the majority of your money that you don't need each month in your savings or high interest savings account and your day-to-day -day expenses that you need for that month, you can move into a checking account, okay? I hope that's clear. They are two different things. If you are going to open a high interest savings account um, and you're going to be making interest on your money, you will have to have a social insurance number to open your savings account. You won't need it for a checking account, but you will need it for the savings account. So I know that the Student Success Center, and I'm not sure if Grad Studies UFA, you might be able to tell me, uh, we do bring in people from, um, the government to help people um, make it easier to get your social insurance number on campus, or you can go to a government um, agency, um, social, anyway, I can tell you what that is later, but you'll, you'll need to have a social insurance number if you wanna open a savings account. So Terry, just to add the, the services offered by International Student Services and that are available to all students regardless of grad or undergrad, so. Oh, okay, yes. great, thank you. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Okay, so it's it's so it it's all it's being done generally in the student success center though, Yufe, when they bring in these people, or do you do it in, in different offices? Uh is uh is in is through the student success center and I'll share a link to where we posted information with okay. everyone. Great. Yeah. yeah, great. Okay, really important to get a social insurance number if you want to work um also in this country. Um you'll need to have a social insurance number. So if your visa allows you to work, you, you should get a social insurance number for that reason as well. Okay, so um, these are just some of the, you know, um, just you can read it, just um, these are the differences between the checking and savings accounts, but basically you use them differently and, and it's mostly because of the interest that we would have you use it differently. And of course, if you're coming with a lot of money, you wanna try to make whatever money you're coming with, if it's supposed to last you, let's say the whole semester, all four months, you wanna keep the bulk of your money in the, in the savings accounts, making interest and only bring in to your checking account what you need for that month, okay? Um, and I'll show you something. Oh, I guess I will in a minute. Okay, um, so financial institutions can do more than just help you manage your money. Um, they can give you loans and mortgages and of course the credit cards and the debit cards and they can also help you invest. Um, I told you there are two types. There's the, the federal banks and the provincial credit unions. Um, so when you're thinking about where should I go, think about one, where you live because a lot of people do they're, you know, they, they, they might do their banking, um, you know, um, at, a, at these uh, automated teller machines, these ATMs. Um, if you're going to be someone who's going to do that a lot, you think use these machines, um, it'll cost you money. There'll be a, and it's steep. It could be anywhere between four or five, even more dollars. Um, every time you use Every time you use an ATM that isn't in your bank, that isn't part of your bank, then it's going to be a fee from your bank and a fee from the machine that you're using that isn't at your bank. So it could be $2 from the actual machine and $2 when it hits your bank because you haven't used your own bank's machine, branch's machine. So you take out $20 because you need $20 of cash. You just want it handy in your pocket and it will end up costing you $24 to take out 20 bucks. So um, be careful where you bank. You want, might want to make it, you might just want to pick one that's very close to where you live so it's handy, okay? Or one that's right by the university um, because you're going to be on campus and 
you know, near there. So uh, one thing is where are you going to live? How many transactions are you going to have? So some banks will have um, for students, maybe free unlimited free student card. And some banks may charge you, give you 10 transactions a month and then start to charge you. So keep in mind, you know, um, what the fees uh, are around transactions and go to a bank that, um, you know, suits your needs better. Um, so Terry, we do have a re relevant question. Sorry to cut you off. No, no, that's fine. So moving back to your previous point, so does moving money from savings to checkings or vice versa cost any money? Yes, that's a transaction. That's a called a transfer. Every time you transfer money, you're going to have a, you're going to have, if you don't have an unlimited plan, um, then after you hit your the minimum that you are allowed for free, you'll have to pay money. Thank so that's why, yeah, okay. That's why I think it's really important that you understand what these transactions are because it sounds so great to get a free account, but if that free account has 10 transactions and you're doing 20, 30, 40 transactions a month, and some kids do, some students do a lot of transactions, it'll cost you a fortune. Better to pay $9.95 for the month and have it unlimited, okay? Um, okay, so- Oh, sorry, said, there is another question uh, mm -hmm. about the uh, using bank. So is there any difference in using debit or credit cards on accounts opened in banks compared to provincial credit unions? No. Essentially, the credit, the, the, these two credit unions and, and, and the big banks, the federal banks, um, they really offer the same kinds of services. I mean, they're going to be competitive and whatnot, they're, but they're offering all that, you know, they all like you can get debit cards, you can get loans, you can get mortgages, you can get credit, everything you can get at a bank, you can get at a credit union. Okay. The difference is, is what the cost might be, what the interest rates might be. And um, just the ease of using some of them. Okay. Um, like I said, if you get into trouble with, you know, financially, there's some problems down the road. The, the, the big federal banks, because profit is the bottom line, they're not as flexible because the way credit unions see their members, they see them as part of their family, their members. Um, the, if there's any wiggle room, they'll do it. You know, do you know what I mean? They can be a little bit more flexible. That's why I think I like um, I just all my years of working with people who have been in bad situations financially, the credit unions have been more willing to step up than the big banks have. So I'm a little bit partial to credit unions, but really they're all do the same thing. OK, um, so what you want to do is take a look at how you're going to where you are and how, how you're going to use the banking system in order to figure out where you should go. And also, you know, what types of accounts and what the interest rates are. So I'm going to show you. Oh, one thing before I move on to show you something. Um, it's a tip. People get really stuck on, oh, well, I, I you know, uh, my parents introduced me to the Bank of Montreal when I was, you know, 16 years old and I had my first job. And now they're 70 years old and they've never moved from the Bank of Montreal. There's this thing that, oh, if I stay at one bank, there's going to be all this, you know, loyalty and they're going to reward me. But that's not how the banking system works. They don't, there's no loyalty to you. When you're doing fine financially and you've got money and you're paying your bills, all financial institutions love you. When you get into financial difficulty, you stop not being able to pay your bills and, and you know, and, and your loans or your mortgage doesn't matter if you've been there 30 years. If you're not paying, they're not loyal to you. So I say, do your banking and use a whole bunch of different types of banks or credit unions, depending on what you need them for. We do have a question, if we can. Okay, let's um, do some questions, yes. Okay, one question is, um, what are the organizations that checks uh, one's credit score and does it downgrade or upgrade the score? How does that yeah. work? Oh, that's interesting. And that's another thing, I, very quickly, um, I think I'm frozen. Can you hear me? I can hear you, but okay, I, your okay. face is frozen. That's okay. Okay. <laughs> um, so uh, there's two credit bureaus in Canada, actually uh, in, in North America and around the world where they have them. Um, it's called Equifax and TransUnion. Every time you um, borrow money, like a credit card, or you're paying something like your internet bills or your cell phone bills, they that particular, whoever you're using, that creditor, um, reports to these credit bureaus, either Equifax or TransUnion or both, and tell them whether or not um, you paid on time. If you've paid on time, 
it's actually quite interesting. If you pay on time, they give you points for having paid on time and that actually increases your score, which is sort of neat. That's how, that's why using a credit card or paying bills like, uh, like cell phone or, or um, internet plans and whatnot really are great because they help you build your credit. If you don't pay on time, if you are late, if you have a really, you put a lot of money on your, on your credit card and it's very close to the, to the limit that you're, you know, you have been given by them, then um, you lose points and then your score goes down. And so what you're doing in Canada when you're trying to build a good credit report is you want to always pay on time. You want to not use your credit card anywhere near it, its limit. Um, there's a whole bunch of things that you can do that minimize, that actually help you um, build a score. And if you don't use it properly, all sorts of things that help you lower your score. And so that's why we really encourage you to come to one of our workshops on how to use credit wisely, um, how to use a credit card properly, because it's a bit of a game. And when you understand the rules of the game, you can really um, use, you can build credit really well. And if you don't understand what you're doing and you make mistakes, you can really hurt your credit uh, rating and score. Thank you, Terry. And then there's two more questions. So yeah. they're both about uh, trans. Oh, no, not, not really. But so the first question is about when they open their bank account, does it mean they have opened both checking and saving or does it depend on their just selection at the time? It's the selection. It's you choose. I mean, most most banks will automatically just open a checking account because that's you know how you pay your day to day bills. And then you have to make a determination if you want to open a savings account, which I think because a lot of international students do come with chunks of money to last them, it makes sense for you to hold extra money that you don't need each month in a savings account. And that's when you, this is, I want to show you this. Hmm. See this here. Can you see that ratehub.ca, www.ratehub.ca? That is a fabulous, fabulous, um, link to a, a website that talks that compares all not all but quite a few of the different banks and credit unions and virtual banks that exist across the country it will tell you um you know what their um what their um, interest rates are on savings accounts um on on some investing like guaranteed investment certificates and so you can go on there and it will actually I don't have time. I wanted to go in and show you how it works, but go on it and fool around with it. You'll see that it will give you a lot of information about um, different banks their, and their accounts. You can also use it to find um, uh, investment investments. It, it, the Rate Hub does a whole bunch of things. It's a comparison app and it's great to find. Um, it'll help you. Also, there's another uh, great, um, if you want to put it in the, um, in the chat, Yufei, um, it's called FCAC, FCAC.gc.ca. That is the Financial Consumer Agency of Canada. It's a government, um, a government website. It is the most safe, up-to-date, accurate website you can find on all things financial because the government is, is, is in control of it. It will have something called a, an account selector tool, account selector tool. Not only will it talk about interest rates um, like Rate Hub will do, but it, it actually will talk about, you know, um, just give you information about, you know, transaction costs. It'll just actually, it, 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 it gives you more information about the different accounts and the different financial institutions across Canada. So those are two really good places to go to if you're trying to figure out what you should do. And you can always come to us and we'll help you. <laughs> Thank you, Terry. And someone just said this is one of the best webinars attended until now. So good, great, great job. There, I, there's obviously a lot more content. Oh, you know what? There's so much. More. I feel so badly that I can't, um, that somehow this is messing up and I have to leave. But honestly, do I have time for maybe one more? One more if possible. Five? So, um, So one last question about credit scores. Yeah, sure. Yeah, do international transaction count in as account tours or in relevant to credit scores? Credit scores and credit reports um, are all based on assessing your risk of paying back. 
so it never talks about what kind of money you have or what you've done in another country. It's how well have you paid your bills in Canada now kind of thing. So what you've done in other countries doesn't count. Um, it, it's really you have to build in Canada and use and, and borrow or and basically borrow money and show them that you can pay back on time and um, and pay. Yeah, that's what it is. It's, it's assessing risk, if that helps. Does that help? <laughs> yeah, that, that, that's helpful. Okay. Should I try? Okay. There's um, no I'm more on questions, but I just oh, yeah. want to remind everyone that this re this presentation was is being recorded and after processing, so captioning, editing, it will be uploaded into our grad studies orientation webinar, and the link to the webinar can be found in our orientation hub. So I really highly encourage you to go to our orientation hub because it contains step by step instructions on what to do to become a student. So please check it out. Yeah, that sounds good. And I, I can, um, I just want to see, I already talked about credit cards. On here too, if you, if I, if you want to see um, this, this is a little thing on budgeting and saving. And actually, just for you to know, two thirds of students run out of money before the end of the semester. You, you know, if you're running out of money, that's normal. What we want to do is stop you from running out of money. That's why we want you to come to these webinars and workshops to learn about stuff. Um, why do people run out of money? Well, expenses are higher than you thought. Maybe you were thought you were getting money from your home country and something's changed in currencies with your parents' jobs, um, you know, with, with your community having access to, to getting money, whatever. Um, it's just, you know, um, things change. So, and, and that happens. So the very best thing that I can tell you is have a spending plan, make a budget and start looking at your expenses, um, you know, right in that first month that you get here, you know, give yourself Tom some time to see how much things cost and, and get a handle on Hamilton and costs. And then actually do, um, do a spending plan, make a plan and see, are you going to run out of money? Because if you are, does it mean you need to get a, um, a part-time job? Does it mean you need to talk back with your family um, overseas and see if they can do more. Um, it may mean that you've got to be more careful about how you're spending, you've got to cut back on stuff. So really important, and that's one of the things that I do the most of is help people make their spending plan. And I don't tell you what to spend or how to do it. I talk to you about what's important to you, what do you want to accomplish, and we try to make a plan um, based on your needs. So you know what, I, I'm going to have to leave and I may run out of juice anyway, but please feel free to write me, um, to make an appointment with me even before you come if you want, or when you get here, come and see Max Money Center. We are here to support you and to make your life here financially um, as, as successful as we can, okay? And I'm sorry I didn't get through. And you say, I will talk to you later this afternoon and try to give you other stuff that I didn't get to. All right, thank you so much for being here and being available, Terry. Oh, you're welcome. And everybody have a good day and hope to see you when you come here to Canada. Bye. All right, have a great day, everyone. Thank you, bye.